So, so uh, Mike and the HPA uh, came to me and asked if I would uh, give a talk a little bit about what I've done since I've graduated UCSB. So it's the, I've given a lot of lectures for Doctors Without Borders and for USAID. And I've never quite given any lecture which is like, you know, Jason, this is your life. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today uh, about m what I've done essentially since graduating UCSB and what, I, what brought me back to Santa Barbara. Uh, in the first place. So just so you know, uh, my name is Jason Prostowski. I don't have any disclosures whatsoever to make. I am on the board of directors for Doctors Without Walls, Santa Barbara Street Medicine. I'm the acting uh, medical director, uh, but it's a volunteer job. So if you do decide to come out to volunteer with us, I don't get paid any extra. I don't work with the pharmaceutical industry or with the insurance industry. I, uh, I do work at Cottage Hospital in the emergency department, and I'm also faculty here at UCSB. So some of you may have heard, we Doctors That Walls teaches a class in the winter quarter, uh, Medicine for the Underserved. It's Independent Study 75. We have an all-star lineup of guest speakers coming from all over the world who are going to talk about uh, providing uh, medical care for marginalized and vulnerable populations. I think I haven't quite roped in Dave uh, Lennon yet, but we're, we're, we'll probably talk afterwards and we'll book him. So. Uh, uh, it's going to be a really exciting class. We're going to hear speakers talk about refugee populations, migrant farm worker populations, homelessness, uh, building infrastructure in post-conflict regions, working with veterans, working with the elderly. It's going to be a very exciting class. Definitely check it out. Um, I heard that it's already full, uh, but I also told our, our friends at Cheadle Hall that we're not going to turn any students away. So uh, come to the first class and we'll figure out a way to get you into it. Um, so it's going to be very exciting. Anyway. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I'm going to hand the conch over to, uh, to Ryan to talk about uh, our, our organization. So for those of you, some of you may have seen me speak before, and I've given a few lectures about Doctors Without Borders here on campus. Uh, I always start with this. Uh, the laser's not working real well, but this picture right here, I always start off with this picture. And just as a, as a symbol, as a imagery, as far as the challenges we face with global health. I took this picture in Uganda uh, in 2006, right near the Congo-Rwanda border. It was in 2006, it was right near the time of the Congolese election, so we had about 5,000 refugees and a horrific measles uh, epidemic. And what you see there is a, the, it says safe water, and this was the source of all of our Shigella uh, that we saw in our clinic. And Shigella is a bacteria, some of you may be taking bacterial pathogenesis here at UCSB and you know that the Shiga toxin is a very horrible toxin, causes horrific bloody diarrhea. Uh, and you can also see there's a, a young boy there uh, who's fetching water for, for, his, for his family. Um, when, it, when you look at poverty indices, one of the ways we measure poverty globally is how far people have to travel to get their clean drinking water. So this young Lugandan boy is fetching water from this unclean water well and he's not wearing any shoes. Uh, we had about a 60% hookworm infestation, uh, and, uh, and hookworms, uh, if you've taken Curis's class, you know that they, they burrow in through the bottom of the, uh, of the foot. And an adult hookworm will drink about 0.5 mLs of blood per day. Most of these kids had anywhere from 20 to 30 worms, plus they were iron deficient, plus they had malaria, so really, really dangerous anemia. And then in the background, you see a church. And uh, I, I personally, I'm not a very spiritual man. This church was very significant. Uh, for those of you that have done any uh, relief work in sub-Saharan Africa, everyone's got a mobile phone, right? No one has running water. No one has electricity. No one's been vaccinated, but everyone's got a mobile phone. So this church had a generator. So people would come from far, far away to come to mass so they could plug in their phone and charge it during mass. But the problem we had was that this particular preacher uh, was telling his congregation not to let the families uh, be vaccinated for measles because it was a white person's ploy to sterilize black people. And uh, so it was a big challenge given that we, uh, when I was there, and I'll show you some photographs of this, uh, we had any, on our ward any given time about 50 kids with measles and it carries about a 30% mortality. So in my five months in Uganda, I probably saw about 200 or 300 children die of measles. And uh, lots and lots of challenges, misinformation is ripe. And this as an image kind of portrays, for those of you that are choosing, because this is Health Professions Association, so I'm assuming a lot of you are gonna go into one of the health-related fields, uh, be a physician, a nurse, a social worker, a physician assistant, a hospital administrator, a logistician. Um, 
this kind of portrays a lot of the challenges we face when we choose to work in austere environments. And for those of you, I don't see any of our, of our cottage scribes, but for some of you, our students that work with us in the parks, uh, this symbol right here is the Broad Street Pump in London, England, which is one of the international symbols of public health and of advocacy. And it's a good thing to Google one night the Broad Street Pump in London, England, uh, because I like to quiz my students on this. So anyway, without further ado, let's get going. We're going to talk a little bit about my career in global health. We're going to talk about local humanitarianism, uh, why I chose to return to Santa Barbara and what I've done since then. We're going to start talking a little bit about homelessness, and we're going to talk about street medicine right here at home. And at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to talk about some of the great work some of your colleagues are doing. And I'm going to show some photographs along the way. Let me know if it gets boring. I, I kind of didn't know what kind of pictures you'd want to see, so I just put a bunch of hodgepods. Uh, pictures from different places I've traveled. This here, this was the first emergency department that I'd ever really staffed by myself. I was kind of covered it by myself. I was a fourth year medical student. That was in Nicaragua in the highlands in Matagalpa. So I know you have to tolerate this. I make all my medical students read it. I make all my residents read it. This is the definition of health as of the World Health Organization 1948. Notice it doesn't say health is the absence of disease. It's more than that. It's a state of complete physical, emotional, social, and psychological well-being. And if you do choose to dedicate your career to promoting health, understand that it requires a very complex interdisciplinary approach. And I'm sure Dr. Lennon would agree from the county public health that uh, health is a very complicated entity and it's very hard uh, sometimes and challenging to achieve. So anyway, this is where I got my start. Uh, I was uh, 22 years old, I was arrogant, I was living in Isla Vista, and I thought I'd get a, I'd take the EMT course uh, because it looked interesting. I couldn't decide. I thought I was going to teach either be a high school English teacher or be a philosophy professor. I was a double major, uh, philosophy and biology here at UCSB. And I took the EMT course, and then I got a job uh, working for Santa Barbara County, AMR, uh, because girls like uniforms and I wanted to drive trucks fast. <laughs> so. That's why I did it, all right? So I did it, and, uh, and uh, oddly enough, I, it wasn't the uniform and the driving trucks fast. And for those of you that have ever had to drive with me, I do drive like a grandfather. I drive very slow now. Um, what I really turned me on to medicine. And actually, I was working in the emergency department here in Santa Barbara when I made that transition of like, maybe I don't want to be a teacher. Maybe I actually want to be a physician, which actually, the Arabic word for physician is the same for, for teacher. So they're, they're very similar in a lot of ways. And the same group of physicians that inspired me to go to medical school are now my colleagues at Cottage Hospital. So I went to medical school. And these are my colleagues here. You can see I grew up a lot in medical school. Um, I went to night school to get my master's degree in public health. And there were six of us in a combined MD-MPH program at Northwestern. And we were the, the, the rebel rousers. We ran a, a, a free clinic in West Chicago uh, called the Ashland Free Clinic, which was predominantly um, uh, Latino patients. And it really gave me a taste of what it is to do advocacy. I kind of started to dabble in working in community organizing with the homeless population here in Isla Vista when I first started. Um, but once I went to medical school, I started really developing relationships with these patients and seeing them every week and just really listening to the challenges it took for them to get their prescriptions filled, for them to keep their diabetes under control when they didn't know what their next meal was coming. And I really, and all of these guys here are my best friends from medical school, and they're all committed to public health. Parmi right there works for the CDC and the International Division of Child Nutrition. Uh, Danny uh, works at University of Pittsburgh as a pediatric ER doc. And Mitch is an internal medicine doc in Chicago who is now taken over as the medical director of the free clinic. So, and now here I am in Santa Barbara working with Doctors That Wall. So we were kind of the, the liberals who were always getting called into the dean's office for causing trouble. Uh, but, and this re really turned something on for me. Um, my second year of medical school, I had the opportunity of going to Nicaragua. And uh, we went uh, really not knowing what it is we were doing. And we started collaborating with this local women's non-for-profit there in Matagalpa, Nicaragua. And we developed this relationship where we started going every year. In fact, we started going four times a year. And we started getting other medical schools involved so that there was a presence there year round. And now they have a full-time physician that works there. And a lot of what we did was asking the people, what do you need? 
And they said, well, what we need, and understand when I was there, Nicaragua had just uh, ended its civil war within the last five to 10 years. So there was a lot of rebuilding. And a lot of people, the last time they saw a doctor was when they were being tortured. And they don't trust doctors. And a lot of returning, going to the people, we ended up, and we had trouble with our medical school because our medical school didn't really want us to go. And uh, for those of you that have worked with me in the street, sometimes I can be a bit stubborn. And I met with the dean. I said, I, I don't think you understood us. We're, we're going. We'd like your permission, but if you don't give us your permission, that's fine. We're going to go anyway. And, uh, and now it's this well-oiled machine. And, and one of the things that uh, the medical school advertises as far as a global health experience. And this young boy's name was Jason, or Hassan. We were both named Jason, so we got our picture taken. So uh, we actually wrote a paper about that, and put, just to show that there were no hard feelings, we put the dean of students' name on the paper uh, about uh, uh, medical students forging pop, uh, partnerships with uh, international NGOs. And we presented this paper at an international conference in Cuba, where I had the opportunity to actually meet Paul Farmer. This is my big, and this was before uh, the Tracy Kidder book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, which you should definitely read if you're interested in international medicine. Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. And Paul Farmer was this uh, anthropologist at Harvard, and I, I actually convinced him to buy me a mojito because I didn't have any money. I was a medical student. And he gave me some advice on careers in public health. And here's me smoking a cigar in Old Havana, and that's the, uh, inner, that's the, uh, the monument for medical students, for all the medical students who died in the Cuban Revolution. So anyway, graduated from medical school, went to did my residency in Atlanta. Uh, residency is what you do after medical school, and I specialize in emergency medicine. And I went to Atlanta because I knew I wanted to do public health, and I knew I wanted to do public policy, and the CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, is right there in Atlanta. So that's why I went. This is Grady Hospital. It's a big public hospital, a 100-bed ER, a 1,000-bed hospital. Uh, on a s summer Saturday night, we'd see a gunshot wound every 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so incredible training. And once again, it was an inner city, poor population. I always found myself being drawn to these populations where there was poverty, where there was challenges, where there was barriers of access to care. So this is the ambulance bay at Grady. Uh, this is one of my co-residents, uh, Raul, from Venezuela. Um, and here, here he is uh, resuscitating a patient there uh, in the trauma bay at, at Grady Memorial Hospital. And of course, you know, they had to give me vacation, so I pulled up all my vacation. My, uh, my second and third year of residency, and I went to Guatemala. And I spent four weeks in Guatemala in a little town, San Lucas Tolimon, near Lagua Titlan, working with the Mayan population. We were doing mostly um, onchocerciasis, or African river blindness eradication, but also we were going out into the fincas, or the small sub-villages, and providing medical care, asking people. You'll find that the trend is, whether you're working internationally or locally, go to the people, ask them what they need. And most people are pretty clever, and they'll let you know. So this is me going out, and you know, wherever you go, you always meet. And I'm always, from all the places I've been, I'm always so uh, surprised by our similarities, much more than our differences. And there's me when I was young and skinny. And there I am there. You know, one of the joys of being an emergency physician or being a family practitioner is uh, to, to, set up, uh, to set up a clinic, all we need is a mango tree for shade and uh, maybe a little uh, wall for privacy. You know, friends of mine that are neurosurgeons, they need uh, electricity and running water and an anesthesiologist and a place to sterilize their instruments. Me, all I need, and this I think was in a school, we set up a, a clinic in a school to do school physicals one day uh, and all these children. And there's me when I graduated my residency, despite all the problems. Uh, my, my moonlighting job as a, when I was the chief resident there is I was the medical director for a free homeless clinic in, in Atlanta. And uh, it was funny because you have to, in order to moonlight or to do extra work to, uh, on the side, you have to get permission from your boss, from your residency director. So I had to get permission. And he said in his 10 years of being residency director, he'd never had anyone try to get permission to do a moonlighting job that didn't pay anything. So, and that's what I did. I, I was the medical director for a free homeless clinic. So anyway, so I finished my residency. I spent a year as faculty at Emory uh, studying human rights and, and medical ethics in a PhD program. Got disillusioned, I dropped out. And what I do, I went to Uganda. So here's Mark Twain, don't let schooling get in the way of your education. And this is where I went. I spent five months here uh, between, going between Imbarara and Kisoro in, in Uganda. And this is the Virunga Mountains. Some of you may have seen gorillas in the mist. Uh, this is where you go to see the gorillas, right near the Congo-Rwanda border. This is the adult ward. Uh, everyone in the adult ward had HIV, TB, or both. 
Uh, and everyone also had malaria. In fact, malaria was a nosocomial infection for us. Nosocomial meaning you acquire the infection while in the hospital. So if our patients were in the hospital long enough, eventually they'd get bit by a mosquito and develop malaria. You can see we didn't have enough beds for all the patients, so they also slept on the floor in between beds. Um, also, we would do house calls. There was a refugee camp about 30 miles away, mostly Congolese refugees and Somali refugees. Um, and uh, this was the measles ward. Um, so uh, one lucky kid there has a bed, but uh, most people slept directly on the floor or on the, uh, the hard surface. Um, and this little kid here had meningitis. We were in the meningitis belt. So uh, we probably saw maybe two or three cases of meningitis a day. Really horrible disease. And he, once again, young boys fetching water, right? In 1993, plenary decasis at the International AIDS Convention said if one glass of clean drinking water could cure AIDS, one third of the world's population would not have access to that cure. So where you do decide to go to practice medicine, understand that there are going to be incredible barriers to health that we as doctors don't have any control over. This kid here, and I don't know if you can see it, uh, this kid here has this, this dark pigmented rash on his belly, um, and he's, he's got that runny nose, he's coughing a lot. This is measles. So we saw um, a, about maybe 10 cases of measles a day. Measles is the number five cause of death in the world right now, according to UNICEF. Um, some of you uh, may have read papers that there's a relationship between the MMR vaccine, the measles, mump, rubella vaccine, and, the, uh, and autism. Uh, that relationship is based on bad science. And if any of you have any questions, uh, let me know afterwards. I'd be happy to give you some papers to read about it. I'm even happy to send you the original, I think it was the 1997 Lancet paper, looking at 12 patients that made that initial conclusion. So I would listen to the American Academy of Pediatrics more so than, than Jenny McCarthy when it comes to whether or not to vaccinate your children for measles. Uh, because it's a really horrible disease. And, and I'm unable to have a non-biased conversation because I've seen 300 kids die of measles in my career. And it's just not something I can even listen to my hippie friends talk about. Uh, this little kid here uh, originally came in for malnutrition, but he wasn't gaining any weight. So I finally did a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap. And he has HAT, human African trypanosomiasis, also known as African sleeping sickness. Um, I, I talked to the Ugandan Ministry of Health to see if we couldn't get the therapy uh, he needed. And uh, the Ugandan Ministry of Health was unwilling to admit that human African trypanosomiasis had re-entered this region. So we had to do two different samples to send. And uh, by the time the second sample got to the main lab, four days later, the child had died. So politics sometimes does get in the way of health. This child here uh, went to see a traditional healer. Uh, not all traditional healers are good. Sometimes they can be a problem. Uh, we saw a lot of Rwandan traditional healers that, that engaged, they called it, crude, they called it uh, crude tonsillectomies, I called it tonsillar mutilation, where they would, uh, any child that had meningitis or measles, they would uh, pry open the child's mouth, pull out the adenoid tonsils using bicycle spokes. Uh, it carried, the procedure carried about an 80% mortality, eight out of 10 children would die. And a lot of times they'd also leave marks on the chest and on the forehead. This child here uh, did have meningitis and was improving, but the mother took the baby to, to a, uh, to a uh, uh, traditional healer to get this tonsillar mutilation done. And uh, the, the mother paid for this procedure in sexual intercourse, and, uh, and the child died as a result of the procedure. And this is me with my staff in the pediatrics ward. Um, uh, Uganda is a commonwealth country, and the British love to dress up. So I had to wear a shirt and tie to work every day in 110 degree heat. And I already sweat a lot as is. So this is one of, this is the only picture I could find where I didn't have pit stains. <laughs> Louis Pasteur, one of my heroes. Uh, one doesn't ask of one who suffers, what is your nationality or what is your religion? One merely says, you suffer. That is enough for me. You belong to me and I will help you. So I got back from Uganda and I said, holy shit, what an experience. I can't go back to academia. So I went and found a job with Indian Health Services. I said, what is the, I asked, what is the most rural, isolated, uh, culturally immersed uh, opportunity? And they sent me to this place, Chin Li, uh, which is 20% uh, of our population did not have running water or electricity. And about 10% of the population didn't speak English, only Navajo. Um, and this is the ER here. And this is our Navajo EMS. We had an EMT basic and a driver. Um, and they would go out on 45 minute response times. 
uh, on dirt roads and sometimes with pretty horrible trauma. Um, and uh, really extraordinary in what they could do with what little skill sets they had. Of course, you can't practice medicine in the United States without malpractice law. Uh, this is the local malpractice lawyer. You can see Injury Law Center. He practiced out of this trailer right here. And he also had a side business selling propane. I, I, I like to think it's because he practiced such good medicine, he needed the side business to stay in business. So, uh, One of the best parts about working in the Navajo Reservation was the, the hiking and the, uh, the mountain biking. This is Canyon de Chez, which is one of the most spirit, spiritual hub of the Navajo people. And, uh, and there I am, scowling. And uh, one of the best parts about being a physician is the relationships you get to build with people. And Ryan's going to talk a lot more about this. Uh, this is a Navajo grandma who, uh, who, who made me uh, this rug as a thank you for helping out her and her family. And she sold it to me at cost. And a lot of these uh, rugs are real works of art and cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars. And uh, it was just wonderful and such an extraordinary experience becoming part of this Navajo community. Uh, you know, just uh, I have tons and tons of stories, and I, I don't want to bore you because we have, we're short on time, but I remember my first week there, I had a little old uh, grandma came to the ER uh, with a complaint of cancer. And I said, cancer? Why does she think she has cancer? So I kept asking all these questions, weight loss? No. Do you smoke? No. Uh, any pain? No. I'm fine. Uh, how is your appetite? It's fine. Why do you think you have cancer? And then the translator said, ask her about spiders. I said, would you like to tell me about spiders? And she said, yes, I would. Thank you, doctor. A spider walked across my path this morning, and that is a bad omen. And I'm afraid I would want to be checked to make sure I don't have cancer. Because the spider god is the one that came down and taught the Navajo how to weave. So it's wherever you go, you get to learn a lot of these cultural uh, sort of quirkiness that I just absolutely love, and it makes my job so rich. And there's nothing like a desert sunset. And Albert Schweitzer. I do not know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. So I came from the Navajo Reservation, and I, I ran into a bunch of these docs that convinced me to go to medical school in the first place. I saw them at a big conference, and they said, hey, why don't you come out to Santa Barbara? So I said, okay. So I came out to Santa Barbara, and I lived this life where I was basically saving up money working in the United States and then going to travel overseas. So I got it, I got, you know, because rent's so expensive here, I was living in my friend's garage for dirt cheap. All the nurses made fun of me because I was a doctor living in the garage. And uh, Santa Barbara Cottage to this day, I think, is one of the most, best, most well-run hospitals I've ever seen. I've been around to quite a few places. It's really an amazing family of uh, physicians, nurses, and extraordinary healers. Uh, but of course, I couldn't stay too long, uh, and I went to Haiti. And I've been to Haiti now twice. Uh, this is in the Central Plateau, uh, right, near where, um, right near the Dominican border. And, uh, and this is me with one of my Emory medical students. I still had some ties with Emory after leaving there. And I'm always somehow involved with students. And here's a, here's a gentleman. A lot of times from a public health standpoint, it, it's always amazing. They teach you in community organizing, go find out who the leaders of the community are and make them your ally so they can help you with your public health message. And this guy here was like my best buddy. I mean, he got people in line. He helped us with our public health demonstrations. When we, couldn't, when we had a patient who was sick and we lost them to follow up, he'd go out into the village and find them. Didn't speak a lick of English, didn't speak a lick of French, only Creole and a little bit of Spanish because he lived near the Dominican border. So amazing, amazing people. Wherever you go, people, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a kind of an amateur photographer, so you have to deal with all of my images. This is uh, life in the central plateau of Haiti. And it was like this before the earthquake. So uh, there was a great Onion article back, I think, in, uh, in January of last year or something that said, or back when the earthquake, that, you know, earthquake happens in Haiti and Americans realize that there was an island there. You know, that a lot of, uh, when you look at disaster, when you already have underlying poverty and underlying um, and underlying challenges, the impact of the disaster is so great, is much, much greater. Because when you look at the earthquake that struck Japan and the earthquake that struck uh, Chile, it was nowhere near as devastating. So, just amazing images. Um, and I, 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 you know, wherever I go, I always try to learn a little bit of the language so that you can greet people and thank people. It's just common decency, it's common respect. And I love, in Creole, they speak in so many different phrases, and they have, uh, and it's very, very color, 
colorful. Uh, for those of you that have read Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder, up in the upper left, that's Zanmi La Sente. That's Paul Farmer's uh, hospital in Kaj. We spent a few days there helping to staff their inpatient ward. And this is uh, some Creole. Uh, the rock in the water does not know the pain of the rock in the sun. And so many times my Haitian colleagues would tell this to me that my, my, with my white skin and my wealth, sometimes I try to understand, but there's still even barriers to understanding because we're coming from different planets. So I came back to Cottage, worked for a few months, saved up some money, turned right back around and went to Mongolia for three months. So this is Mongolia near the, uh, uh, in, in Ulji, near the Kazakh border. I was working with hospitals to help develop their systems, to help develop the quality of care that they give. Um, and you know, in our off time, we went to go meet some of these eagle hunters. These are uh, people that, the nomadic Kazakhs that live on horseback and they have these huge Central Asian eagles that they used to hunt. And, uh, and I, you know, I got to know them and chat with them and we started drinking vodka together. And one of them, um, th actually this gentleman here, he, had not, he hadn't seen a doctor since the Soviets left. Um, and so uh, he had some medical issues, I helped him out. And after I helped him out, he wanted to take me out hunting with his, with his eagle. Uh, I don't hunt, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a Santa Barbara hippie, right? So, uh, but you know, he, he gave me his hat. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, uh, and, and I remember one night we were in a, we were in a gare in Mongolia drinking vodka, uh, and the, you know, the Mongolian hospitality is extraordinary. I mean, it's some of the worst food in the world, and they don't have much of it, what they have, they're so willing to share with you. And just drinking vodka, and they were teaching me Mongolian songs, they asked me to teach them American songs. Uh, I didn't know what to do because I have bizarre taste, so I, what, what would you guys pick as a song, as a, a musician that represents America? Beatles, good, good British band, good, good. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I went with John Denver, so I, I figured it doesn't get any more American than John Denver. So this is a uh, this is a, a, a Mongolian home. You can see people live in in poverty, and you'll find that those of you that go into healthcare, there is a relationship between poverty and poor health. If you're wealthy, your outcomes are better than if you're poor. Okay, and actually, this is a rich person because you can see they got a solar panel which means that they can turn on the lights at night and actually read so their kids can do homework. So their kids are more likely to have a better future. This is the traditional Mongolian gare, or the Soviets call it a yurt, uh, which is a camel skin tent with a central stove. And, and this is, uh, you know, people would come to hospitals from very far away in these kind of Soviet era jeeps, or, uh, or they, they, whatever transportation they have. And one of the things that I always love, you know, one of my, my cousin is a musician, and he's, he loves it because wherever he goes in the world, he can always jam with people. Music is the same everywhere in the world. And I feel the same way about medicine. And even if we have trouble understanding each other in the language, we still can teach each other and learn from each other in our medical practice. In Mongolia, 80% of the physicians are women uh, because men like to drink vodka and play dominoes. Uh, so, <laughs> And, and this woman right here, I learned so much from because we were talking about, first we were talking about fatigue because in Mongolia, all, all of these patients would come to the, to the hospital with fatigue. They'd be admitted to the hospital and, and they'd get a daily injection of vitamins. And while they were there, they didn't have to deal with any of their horrible, difficult, challenging life at home. And then they'd leave after a week. So they'd always say, you know, Dr. Jason, how do you treat fatigue in America? And I would give this academic answer, well, it depends on the cause. Is it because of a low blood vo volume? Is it because of a low thyroid? Is it because of depression? I'm like, no, 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 we understand all the things. No, fatigue, fatigue. So, so this was, we were talking about treatment of headaches, and I was talking about the different pain medications we use, and this is how she treats headaches. And, and she has great outcomes. They do, uh, uh, they do use uh, um, acupuncture because of their proximity to China for, as a an an localized anesthetic for most of their surgeries. Uh, so once again, you know, I go there expecting to teach and I usually end up learning more than I do teaching. And this, you can see, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, true humanitarians who love taking care of their patients, you know, they, they're, they're happy wherever. This, this woman treated this, uh, this, uh, this older woman's uh, arthritis with hot wax just boiled the wax and put it on the knees and she was able to hobble around. And here's some more traditional Mongolian remedies that I got a chance to learn about. So came back to Cottage Hospital, worked a little bit, saved some money, and then went and turned around and this was my little boutique job. Uh, I ended up becoming the expedition doctor uh, to Antarctica. 
Uh, so I got to take care of a lot of really wealthy people. I spent a lot of money to see penguins. And, and uh, these were my bunk mates. I had a, a, a Scottish ornithologist or bird expert and a British geologist. And we shared a cabin together. And one night we, we decided to settle it forever. What tastes better, Kentucky bourbon or Scotch whiskey? And uh, I, I think it ended in a tie because neither of us could carry the debate on any longer. But it's always fun. Wherever you go, you meet colleagues and you engage in these wonderful, uh, one, you, you, you develop these wonderful relationships. So, and this right here is my crowning achievement. I came back to Cottage Hospital and, uh, and I worked and I saved some money and the, the docs at Cottage said, gosh, you're a really great fit here. Are you interested in staying? And I said, no, I can't. I, I, and I joined Doctors Without Borders. And I told my colleagues, I said, this is my dream. Like, like most kids dream of one day pitching at, at Yankee Stadium or Fenway Park, I dreamed as a doctor of one day joining the major leagues and joining Doctors Without Borders. So we used the French Médecins Sans Frontières. So, uh, and some of you have heard me talk about this. I'm going to talk about it briefly here. So I went to Sudan. And these are some images from Sudan. This is Isabel, uh, our German uh, base nurse. And once again, I'm not going to talk about too much pathology here, but it's more the relationships because it's about going to the people and it's about finding out where the need is and going to where the need is because sometimes the people that need our help the most can't get to us so we actually have to take the care to them. Um, some young Sudanese boys, uh, only in Africa do you see uh, 14 year olds with machine guns and flip flops. Um, this is our malnutrition ward. We, uh, we had a, a malnutrition ward at a therapeutic feeding center um, during the hunger gap the hunger gap is the two months that start right around the time people run out of their stock, their grain stock, and right before the harvest comes in. So that's when we expect to see malnutrition. And you'll find as you're following what's going on in Somalia, it's very frightening uh, because of the food insecurity that's going on there. Uh, during the hunger gap, we had about 100 children under the age of five at any given time uh, who uh, had a severe malnutrition. And uh, malnutrition, if left untreated, is about a 60% mortality. Under the standard of care, it's about a 10% mortality. We had about a 6 or 7% mortality, which meant that on any given night, we'd have about four kids die. And I never once felt good about the fact we were doing better than average. So there's a young malnourished boy, a uh, young child with malaria. Everyone had malaria there. This is Merasmus. Merasmus is one of the manifestations of severe protein energy malnutrition. This child was actually too weak to swallow, so we put a tube down his nose and into his stomach um, and, uh, and, 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 um, and fed him that way. In fact, this mother here, this is a great case. Uh, this child we didn't expect would survive, and we gave the mother this high energy milk, and we said, um, we need you to feed your child one teaspoon of this milk every two minutes. And the, of course, she has no watch, she has no clock. Um, and, uh, and so what she did was she started singing a song. And every time she got to the same section of the song, she would give a teaspoon of this high-energy milk. And she, stayed, she sung that song all night, and that child survived. So wherever you go in the world, a mother's love for a child is truly universal, and people do what has to be done so that health can prevail. And here's one of our less than happy customers. Um, one of the things that I always pride myself on Doctors Without Borders is we never turned anyone away. We offered a free service uh, right in the heart of a war zone in South Sudan. And uh, during the rainy season, people couldn't get to us because they had no roads. Again, when you think about what are the barriers to getting health care, sometimes it's not poverty. Sometimes it's just the fact they can't get to you because they got no roads. Um, uh, so when the dry season came, we had a huge influx of patients. And we didn't turn anyone away. So some of them just slept outside. And we treated them outside. Um, this is also malnutrition. I'll always be haunted and, and inspired by this case here. You can see this young girl uh, eating a, a plumpy nut or ready to use therapeutic food. It's a super peanut butter. Um, in New Air culture, men don't cook. Uh, so when the men would come to the hospital, if they didn't have a woman to cook for them, usually they'd starve. Well, his, uh, his wife, this man's wife, had been killed, but he took his daughter to the hospital. And when the time came, that we thought this child would die and we needed him to give the teaspoon of the high energy milk every two minutes, he did it. And all of the other families of the patients ridiculed him and all of actually our staff did as well. So even our staff that we trained uh, ridiculed him but his daughter survived. And of course uh, the, the Antonov-Kleshnikov bullet uh, 
there, where I was, there was an incredible amount of ethnic fighting between the Nuer and the Dinka. And in fact, just um, in September of this year, uh, the village I spent nine months in was attacked and there were about anywhere from 600 to 2,000 casualties and 50% of our hospital staff is still unaccounted for. So, uh, you know, this place, even though South Sudan is now its own nation, they still have growing to do. And I'll always, always, as a physician, um, be haunted by the amount of trauma and the amount of violence that people are capable of. Uh, this child has diarrhea. Diarrhea is the number one killer in the world. So we give oral rehydration. Uh, mothers love their children. The mama kit. I'm going to talk a little bit about mama kits and show has done a lot of great work with mama kits. Uh, mama kits is everything you need to uh, deliver a baby in your home at, at home. Um, sterile razor blades, uh, cords to tie, the umbilical cord, soap to wash your hands. We use these to bribe women to come into the clinic so they can get vaccinated. Because um, we saw a lot of this. This is neonatal tetanus. This is the number one cause of death of children under one month of age in the world. Uh, we saw about maybe three uh, to four cases a week. Um, and it's caused by cutting the umbilical stump with a, with a dirty instrument. Um, so it's so easy to prevent with a vaccine. So easy to prevent and yet so deadly. In my nine months in Sudan, I saw two, two or three children survive. This gentleman here has leprosy. So another disease of poverty of biblical proportion. Uh, this child here has polio. Um, the big challenge working with the World Health Organization, every, if you have one case of uh, polio where the child's symptomatic, that means there's probably about 200 kids that are shedding virus that are asymptomatic, which means if you have one case, you have an outbreak. So we, did, we went door to door to do polio vaccinations, and about day three of our polio vaccination campaign, we realized that somewhere between Geneva, Kenya, and Sudan, it went three days without refrigeration and we had to start from scratch because the vaccine was no good. So once again, the challenges of working on the streets, uh, the challenges of working in austere environments, sometimes are really outside of the scope of what we typically expect of a healthcare provider. But once again, when you go to the people, it's always the relationships that you make. And uh, you know, these people I spent nine months with, they were my friends and they shared stories about their lives. And they told me about how they were child soldiers and how they ran away and went to a refugee camp in Ethiopia, which is where they learned to read. But then there was a revolution in Ethiopia and they had to leave Ethiopia. And these are their stories. And it was so extraordinary and so humbling that these people that could read at a first grade level, uh, we would teach them how to take care of high risk obstetrics and gunshot wounds and measles. And, and they would always frustrate with me by their ignorance, but also inspire me with their perseverance. So. And here's me doing what I do. I'm always teaching. And this is Tom. I always tell the story about Tom. Our first case of polio, um, I, I got all these posters and I went out into the villages to put posters of limping children to try to get uh, parents to bring their kids in to get vaccinated. And Tom says, you stupid white person, don't you know if you want to get children to come in and get vaccinated, you have to make a song about it. So he made up this song about the importance of vaccinating your children, went out and taught it to all of the villages, and it became like a billboard hit. Like we'd hear strangers walking by the clinic singing this song. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's again, you go there expecting to teach people, but I, I learned from him. And here we are working with our colleagues, messing with kids, and yeah, it's the relationships. It's always the relationships. Uh, in, in East Africa, uh, the act of holding a, when a man holding another man's hand is the highest act of respect you can give someone. I mean, we live in a very homophobic culture here in the United States, but when Mike White, uh, who was the, uh, a logistician uh, ca from Canada, who was there um, uh, for a few months before I arrived, when it was time for him to go, all, everyone was, was fighting to see who could walk him to the runway to hold his hand when he left by plane. I mean, these are the relationships that you make. Uh, uh, in these places. And they're really extraordinary, wonderful, inspiring people. And this is, uh, this is a quote from one of my colleagues, Dr. John Brock. We suture, we record events, we tell the world, we struggle daily with private thoughts of whether or not we make a difference. The ultimate solution may be political, anonymous, and nebulous in some remote tea conference room. But I've seen the blood, the people cry in pain, and people laugh with hope. And I know we need to be there. This is a big, long quote, and I want to read part of it. This is James Orbinski. 
James Orbinski accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of Doctors Without Borders in 1999. This is from his book that he published in 2008 called An Imperfect Offering. Because sometimes for those of us that want to engage in humanitarian action, whether it be internationally or whether it be locally, what we have to offer the people who are suffering the most is at its best imperfect. I mean, we as doctors cannot stop wars. We as doctors cannot create housing. We as doctors cannot stop genocide. But what we can do is we can advocate. We can share the stories that we hear, which is what Ryan's going to do in just a little bit about what we see. And one of the things that James Orbinski said is he said that that last paragraph, Simone Weil in her commentary on Homer's Iliad, a commentary written in the summer of 1940 after the fall of France to the Nazis, remarked that trembling marks those who now feel nothingness in their own presence. It is a trembling, a quivering of those who are reduced to a bare life that is no longer inherently sacred. It is into this silent place that the humanitarian acts. And in speaking from this place, the voice of outrage is raised. It is a voice that bears witness to the plight of the victim and one that demands for the victim both assistance and protection so that the silence does not go unheard. Speaking is the first political act. It is the first act of liberty. And it always implicitly involves another. In speaking, one recognizes, I am not alone. And this does not have to be in sub-Saharan Africa in a war zone. This can be with the homeless community in Santa Barbara. This can be with the migrant farm worker community in rural Santa Barbara County. This can be with any community where they are marginalized, where they're vulnerable, where they're suffering. Sometimes you cannot fix the causes, but what you can do is you can make sure that their suffering does not go unheard. So when I came back from Africa, this is where I went, right? So I came back to Santa Barbara. Worked a little bit at Cottage, started working at Loma Linda University and at UCLA, and found myself doing lobbying work in Washington, D.C. This is, uh, at the time, I was registered to vote in Georgia, and this is a group of my friends from Georgia. This is uh, Derek Kagongo, who works for CARE International. He recently got nominated as one of CNN's heroes of the year. Uh, he, uh, he works for CARE as a lobbyist, but he also uh, collects don uh, soap from hotels and recycles it so it can be used in refugee camps to promote hygiene. Uh, and this here is uh, Johnny Isaacson. He's a senator from, uh, senator from Georgia. He also sits on the Committee for African Affairs. And I spent an hour with him and his aide just talking about what I'd seen in Africa uh, because he needed to hear it as, as my representative. And of course, this is Lois. Uh, do everyone know who this is? Raise your hand if you know who your, your local state assemblyman is. Raise your hand if you know who your local state senator is. Raise your hand if you know any of your city council members. Raise your hand if you know who your congressperson is. Okay. When you go and become health professionals, you have a responsibility to find out who these people are and tell them what you see. This is Lois Capps. Uh, she's congress for the 23rd district, Santa Barbara County. Every time I admit a patient to the ICU at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital, because they lost their job and ran out of their medicine and had an exacerbation of their illness requiring them to be in the ICU, I email her and let her know. Because that's my responsibility as her eyes on the ground so that she can advocate to the House of Representatives the quality of health care for the American people. Medicine is a social science. Politics is nothing but medicine on a grand scale. So this is my final story to tell you. Uh, last year, I, I stayed in the United States for about eight months. I'm sorry I'm going over a little bit. Um, and, uh, and I found myself returning um, to a war zone shortly after. I, I couldn't stay in the United States. I just, something was missing, so I went back out again. And I found myself in the Palestinian territories. Now, this is a very politically uh, controversial place. So, despite what your own personal beliefs are, whether you refer to it as Palestine, whether you refer to it as the Palestinian territories, whether you refer to it as the occupied Palestinian territories, whether you're Jew or Muslim, whether you're Arab or Christian, one thing is very certain, health disparities exist. That this wall, you can call it the apartheid wall or you can call it a security wall, the likelihood of death before your fifth birthday is much different depending on what side of the wall you're born on. The likelihood of you dying in childbirth is much different depending on what side of the wall you're born on. And one thing that we as physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals have a responsibility to go to the people and address health disparities regardless of politics and religion. And that's what I did. And I went here. This is the emergency department 
in Ramallah, which is this, uh, the capital of the Palestinian Authority. Um, and this is the emergency department in Nablus, uh, which is uh, in, during the Second Intifada, the source of most of the terrorist activity. And I helped the Ministry of Health develop emergency health care infrastructure, um, develop a pre-hospital emergency medical system, and develop a national disaster preparedness plan. So we got them to develop a resuscitation room. We made rules. Uh, sometimes the rules were not as enforced as we like, but we made rules. And what do you do? You go to the people and you start with what you know. So I started working overnight shifts in the emergency department with my Palestinian colleagues. Uh, this is a medical student here. After this picture was taken, I told her that she's not supposed to view x-rays this way. She's supposed to put them on the view box. That's how mistakes are made. This is uh, the emergency department in Nablus. I worked side by side with these guys. I shared tea with them. I shared hummus with them. We shared a lot of really funny stories. I remember one night we got the ER cleared out at 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and no women ever worked overnights because uh, Muslim women are at home with their husbands at night. So it was all men. And they started asking me about whether or not my parents were going to choose a bride for me. And I said, and of course me, I'm trying to tell them how dating works in America. Like, well, actually, i got to go out and find her and, you know, introduce myself and get her to like me. <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way. You know, and it's, uh, you know, all these fun stories that these are colleagues who are practicing medicine together, we're jamming together. And this is the emergency department in, in, in Hebron. And uh, this is uh, another uh, hospital, uh, a Watani hospital in uh, Nablus. This is a public health poster in, in Al Watani, and you can see that uh, we're trying to promote breastfeeding. And you see the breast is blacked out there. Very conservative Muslim community. Right? Some things you are the same no matter where you go. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we went to the people, asked them what they needed, and they said, well, we go to these checkpoints, and there's always delays at the checkpoints, and people get sicker. Um, now, we can't, you know, the Israelis have a right to protect themselves, to make sure that no, no, no harmful people are coming into Israel. Um, but at the same time, there are all these women in labor that were going through checkpoints and delivering right there at the checkpoint while waiting. So what did we do? We started training local midwives in how to deliver babies. And you can see here, these are local midwives, you can see the pelvis there, uh, because once again, we as doctors, we can't, we can't convince the Israelis to let sick people through the checkpoints. What we can do is make sure that we have certain medical people at the checkpoints who can take care of needs. And training the people. Now, here's me with a group of primary care doctors, how to read EKGs. I love ultrasound. To me, ultrasound is a stethoscope of the next generation. And uh, giving lectures to a group of uh, colleagues. And of course, always go to the people, working side by side with my colleagues, learning from them, and teaching them. We got the textbooks. These textbooks stayed in Israeli customs for four months, but we got them. And we got them to where they needed so they can improve the quality of health for a place uh, with, which is very underserved. We set up a triage system. For those of you that do work in the emergency room or been EMT certified, this is a big deal. Um, Traditionally, the person who gets seen first in Arab culture is the loudest, or the one who has the most wasta, or the most sort of community prestige. Um, and we tried to say, no, the people we see first are the sickest. And here it is. This is our triage station in uh, ER in Hebron. And this looks a lot like, for those of you that volunteer with us in the parks, looks like one of our mobile clinics. Same thing. Here's me with the uh, uh, chair one of Loma Linda University and the Minister of Health. I met with him once a week to uh, discuss policy. Uh, we convinced him to start a Palestinian emergency medicine residency program that is still going to this day, so that the Palestinians would have physicians who are trained to be the stewards of an emergency system. This was the sign I had up over my desk. Anyone that came to me, I was working for USAID, which is the United States Agency for International Development, and anyone that came to me with me had to look at that sign. It says, what did you do today? Did you improve the quality of health for the Palestinian people? Did you spend the American taxpayer money appropriately? are staying true to your fundamental core values and walking a path of virtue, wisdom, service, courage, integrity, and compassion. If yes, you may return to work tomorrow. And I stayed there for nine months. And this is beyond mountains. There are more mountains. Once you overcome one challenge, you see another. So I came back to the United States uh, around this time last year, and this is where I found my home. Because I always need an underserved, marginalized population to take care of. This is Dr. Mimi Duhan, uh, my mentor, uh, talking to uh, one of our friends, uh, I think this is in Isla Vista. Uh, homelessness, um, 
Just so you know, someone who's homeless is a person considered to be who lacks fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence and has a primary nighttime residency that is either supervised publicly or privately operated shelter, an institution that provides a temporary residence or a public or private place not designed for or nearly used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings. So this is how the National Coalition for the Homeless defines homelessness. Um, without getting too much into it, um, homelessness is this very bizarre thing and, and David Lennon, I'm sure, could talk about it with much more detail than I can, uh, where you, you have one sort of term that's used to describe a very diverse group of people. People that are mentally ill, people with substance abuse, people that are fleeing a, a violent household. Most women and families that are homeless are fleeing intimate partner violence or domestic violence. We have a lot of children that are homeless. We have veterans that are homeless. 13%, I believe, the common ground data in Santa Barbara is 17% who have served our country, that have resources available to them, are still homeless. And uh, here, what we found out in February, is that here in Santa Barbara County, uh, we have a lot of homeless as well. About 1,536 encountered, 29% uh, live on the streets. When asked uh, why they came to Santa Barbara, um, it's interesting, 12% came for the climate, only 5% came for the services. So a lot of people say, well, the reason people come to Santa Barbara is because of all the services we offer them, therefore we should stop providing those services and get them kicked out. But when you actually look at the data, that, that just is not, is not necessarily the case. Um, the demographics um, of the families, over half are fleeing domestic violence. So when you're thinking about who is this homeless community that you may or may not make eye contact with when you walk down State Street, a lot of these people have stories as well. And then when you engage with them and learn their stories, develop relationships with them, you'll be very surprised. Vulnerability index, I'm just going to go pass this over because uh, uh, Dr. Lennon's going to talk about it. It's really interesting. Uh, Jim O'Connell is already booked. He's going to come give a lecture at our underserved medicine course. This is really groundbreaking research, and he at Boston was really influential in taking homelessness out of the sort of social model and into the public health model. And he did a cohort where he followed a group of 119 homeless people for six years. After six years, 31% of them were dead. That's about the equivalent of being diagnosed with stage three lung cancer. So being homeless is an independent risk factor to being dead. Um, so when we think about homelessness, uh, I always quote my, my good friend Jennifer Ferez. Jennifer Ferez was once asked, what percentage of the homeless are mentally ill? She always says 100%. And when asked why, she says, you take someone that's already sick, that's already scared, that probably already has underlying mental health disease, and substance abuse. They don't know when their next meal is coming. They're exposed to the elements. After six months, any one of us would be a little bit crazy. Um, and it's just, just humanity. These are what people died of in six years in, uh, in O'Connell's study. And uh, Ryan's going to talk a little bit more about this. So I found my home here in Santa Barbara, working in the ER, teaching at UCSB, and walking the streets, once again going to the people, asking them what we need, what they need, working with other collaborative partners like Santa Barbara County and other amazing non-for-profits here in our community to take better care of them. Some of these patients are too sick and too scared, too traumatized to actually seek care in a clinic or a hospital, so we bring the care to them, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about the people we're serving. And we need to find and be creative to find a better way to serve them. This is my hero and my, uh, my mentor, Dr. Jim Withers, who uh, is also going to come talk at our underserved medicine course. And he says, the essence of healthcare is going to where people are, either physically or even more importantly, spiritually and emotionally, when they're shown that they matter. When that really sinks in, then hope grows. And amazing things happen. You know, if I could, I'd write a prescription for a house for all the street people, because it's immensely important for health. So final thought. Service opportunities and environments of great poverty and challenge will be available throughout the duration of your education and your career. So seek them out. Talk to your colleagues here at Street Health Outreach. Go to our website, Santa Barbara Street Medicine. Join Santa Barbara County and the Vulnerability Index. There's lots of opportunities. If you want to do the greatest good, you have to go to where there's the greatest need. And you must meet people where they're at. It's not about us, it's about the people we're serving. Integrity means expressing your principles. I hear so many people who tell me what they believe, and I'm so tired of hearing it. So I quote Martin Luther King Jr. I say, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you do, and I'll tell you what you believe. 
It's our responsibility to pay attention. It's our responsibility to take action. It's our responsibility to speak out on what we see on behalf of those with no voice and to do it in such a way that people listen. The French call it timonage. That's what Doctors Without Borders says. You as students, maybe you might think as a student you have no voice. As a student you can't change the world. But you, that's, that's a miscommunication. That's a misunderstanding. A group of students just toppled a government in Egypt not that long ago. By going to the people and listening, you actually are engaging in a sacred humanitarian act where you are letting someone know that they matter. And that is an incredibly powerful thing to give. So doctors put on band-aids. It's public health workers, grassroots activists, engineers, policymakers, teachers, program developers, social workers, social advocates. They're the real heroes that save lives. And you know what? It's been a hell of a ride since I left UCSB. Uh, teaching at UCSB, working at Cottage, and serving the community, it's such a privilege. Um, in the words, I, you know, I did do a year of graduate school in philosophy, so you have to tolerate it. Albert Camus, nonetheless, he knew that the tale he had to tell could not be one of final victory. It could only be uh, the record of what it had to be done, again, in the never-ending fight against terror and its relentless onslaughts, despite their personal afflictions, by all who, while unable to be saints, but refusing to bow down to pestilences, strive their utmost to be healers. Nothing like an African sunset. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to hear what Ryan has to say, so hold your applause if you can, because Ryan's going to tell you a little bit about Doctors Without Walls, Santa Barbara Street Medicine.